Mark, thanks so much for uh, coming up to New York. Great to have you back uh, in town for this. Um, I want to start uh, with the title of the book, um, Safe Haven. Um, and of course, the role that that plays in kind of the work that you do at Universa and, and thinking about you know, the way that you approach markets and really defining to you what qualifies as safe haven, because I think it's different than the way many investors might, might think about it. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a broad subject. I mean, you know, obviously, safe havens are the things that we um, sort of invest in to sort of give us shelter from the storm um, protection um, when markets are doing bad things. But it's just so much more complicated than that. And what we, I think what I end up sort of showing in my book, and what's so important to me as a, as a sort of a risk mitigator uh, as a profession, is that you know, risk mitigation can end up really being the costliest thing we do as investors. Um, so that, that's kind of the point that I get into in talking about safe havens, um, uh, and it's sort of the counterintuitive aspect of it. We need to think about our safe havens as being cost effective, which is something that you don't often hear used in the, in the investing industry, simply because safe havens uh, or risk mitigation typically is not, in fact, it hardly ever is. It's usually something that costs us. It's usually the cure um, that's worse than the, the disease. And, and I'm curious also, you know, your the role that writing plays in your process as an investor, because you can kind of go through, you know, the Warren Buffett's of the world, Howard Marks has written, um, and, and you know the the way that you maybe think through writing, frankly, um, as an investor, and how that's fit in in your experience, where you see that going forward, and you know, frankly, why write a book? You've got plenty of other things going on, and you know why this maybe helps you and your firm, you know, fine tune your process in a way. Yeah, writing to me is basically introspection. Um, you know, it gets you thinking about the basics, the whys. It gets you thinking about first principles from my standpoint. To, to me, what's the greatest first principle from, for what I do? It's why do people not only invest, what's their purpose or goal as an investor? What's their purpose or goal in risk mitigation? It seems like such an obvious thing, but actually we would not agree on what that is. Mm -hmm. People in, in, modern, in the finance industry would not agree with me on what that is. They would say it's something like some utility function or some or mean variance, you know, information ratios. I would say the purpose of investing is the same as the purpose of, of mitigating risk. That's to raise your wealth over time, raise the the the, uh, the uh, lower the range of that wealth in the future and raise it. Um, that's a that's a uh, that, that's a crazy thing to say actually. Um, but, uh, uh, we, but, so we, but we face this problem as investors. I call it the dilemma of risk, the great dilemma of risk. If you take too much risk, it costs you over time. You, know, you can't if you use leverage. If you take too little risk, it costs you over time. This is precisely the problem that pension funds are dealing with and their underfunding problem. Is it too much or too little? Sometime, somehow you've just got to thread that needle. But I think that if we think about this, and again, going back to your question, just sort of think about this on a first principles basis, maybe it's the case that um, um, taking risk and not enough risk, offense versus defense, maybe that's just two sides of the same coin. And I think that it is. I think that the reason we mitigate risk is actually to do a better job being offensive. I mean, there's a Sun Tzu quote that, uh, 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 that attack is really the secret um, to defense. And the defense is the planning of an attack, right? We could all agree in this room that over the next 20 years, I'm the most bearish guy you're ever going to meet, but we could all agree in this room that in the next 20 years, probably the S&P is the best thing to be in. If you could make one trade right now, it's probably the, by the S&P, right? Despite what's going on and how expensive it is today. So we know that mitigating risk really isn't about sort of where we think the world's going to be. What the, the, what the mitigating risk is about is what that path is going to look like mm -hmm. and the opportunities that you have along that path, right? The dry powder that you create. Um, so we need to think about offense and defense in very much the same way. It's like, you know, I guess it allows you to be more long, some people would say. Is that maybe like, that, that as you're speaking, that kind of comes to me, this notion of, you know, the reason you would be um, taking insurance out, the reason you would be short anything is you can make bigger bets on kind of that future you're talking about. Yeah, but it doesn't typically work that way. Mm -hmm. Typically, most risk mitigation as mm -hmm. we know it, um, choose your canonical safe haven risk mitigation strategy, whether it's a hedge fund or bonds, or, they are really more of a dilution of risk. So what, that's really not allowing you to be more long. Mm -hmm. That's the opposite. That's, that's making you less long. So somehow along this path that I described over the next, let's say, 20 years, you've got to find ways of having that dry powder when the moments are the greatest. It sounds to me like it requires being some kind of tactical edge to do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, none of us have that. So this, this is the problem. This is why most risk mitigation strategies are the cure 
that's worse than the disease, and most risk mitigation um, is, the more, is the costliest thing that people do. And so one of those you write about um, in the book is treasuries. Um, and you know, I'm just curious what you've made maybe of the last two months we've seen um, across the curve, and you know, is this essentially, my reading of the book, watching the markets, is like, well, this is proving the point on sort of you know, where you get into trouble with this, but I'm just curious what you make of the move we've seen in treasuries and you know, what it is indicative to you, if, if anything, in this market moment. Uh, treasuries are not a safe haven. They're, uh, they're, they, I say this in the book, they're very much a hopeful haven. Um, so yeah, I mean, they have their place. I, I think that they're pretty cheap right now, frankly, so I don't want to trash them too much, but as a strategic- They won't take it personally. So. Yeah, as a strategic um, risk mitigation strategy, they're, 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 they're highly statistical. They're not, um, they're not mechanical. It's a difficult thing to rely on, but this is what the world relies on in this sort of canonical 60-40 uh, portfolio. Um, but you, we, you know, the, the major point that I make in this book is that not all risks are the same, and we need to always remember that. Treasuries, to answer your question about treasuries, they just don't address that very well. In, in, in much like any other normal risk, any hedge fund or whatever, they just don't address the, the, the nonlinear nature of risk. You know, I, as a business, we protect um, very large losses. That's what we're there for. It's not just because they're scary. It's not just because they're large. It's not just because uh, they make headlines. It's because they actually mathematically it's what matters. The little losses don't matter, it's the big ones. Because, going back to what I said before, the purpose of risk mitigation uh, uh, should be to raise your terminal wealth at some point over time. And, it, and that, what that means, the equivalent of saying that, is that it should raise your rate of compounding over time. Not your mean variance, but your rate of compounding, your geometric average return. And it turns out the geometric average return is a very counterintuitive, funny thing that we just don't really understand. We think of our returns linearly, you know, you look at a Minus 10% or plus 6%. We look at that, it's a linear number. It's, it's yeah. right, it's arithmetic. It goes into an arithmetic average. Whereas what really happens in compounding is the more you lose, the more that actually has an overweighted uh, bearing on your compounding. Um, you know, you can just think about this intuitively. You know, you lose 50% one period. You gotta, you, make, you gotta make back 100% the next. So there is an asymmetry there. And of course, that nonlinearity, it's not just two to one, it gets worse and worse and worse. The closer you get to losing 100, the closer you get to having to make infinity to make it back, right? So there's a huge nonlinearity there. And it turns out that the only way you can do what I was describing, which is to, to raise your rate of compounding in, uh, as a goal of risk mitigation, is to focus on these big losses, because th those are the things that impact um, your, your, rate, your rate of compounding. Uh, going back to that 20-year horizon, you know, right now, looking back 20 years, that CH compound growth rate was about 9.5% or so, going back 20 years. But in, if instead we go back to the lows of 2020 and look at and recalculate that 20-year CAGR, it was down to 4%. You can see how destructive, it happens that, that you, you know, in that 20 years you were starting at the peak of the dot-com era and of course you're looking at the low, but that was really costly. That 4% right there, that cost you about o over 4X in incremental terminal wealth. That's a really big deal. And I guess I think about it as a normal person who has the majority of his money in the S&P, any that's invested. Um, I feel like reading your work and even just talking here, like. Am I timing the market in a way that I hadn't thought about? Because you can do the math. All 20-year rolling periods are at, you know, positive on average over time. But that doesn't really account for the fact of, well, if I ended in 2008, that, that certainly wasn't there to save me. Or I was going to have some problems with that. Is that maybe something that you know, I am not thinking enough about or that is a way that perhaps even worse, professional investors are not thinking about when they're advising their clients on what it really means to have you know, a long time horizon. For sure, for sure. And that is because the whole industry, all the modern finance is based on this idea of modern portfolio theory, which is this, uh, it, it's this basic idea that you, um, what, what we wanna do is we wanna maximize this ratio of, 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 of av arithmetic average returns, not compound average returns, but arithmetic average returns to risk or volatility or whatever you wanna measure, they, they would use volatility. And that, if you're doing something good with that ratio, the idea is you're doing something productive. Whereas, even if it's making you poorer, so I would argue that, that this is uh, sort of a, a superficial narrative. You know, it's said that diversification, and that really is what we're talking about here, bonds, whatever it is, we're talking about diversifying portfolios, what Peter Lynch calls diverse, appropriately diversifying portfolios. This has been called by great luminaries like Dalio, you know, the holy grail of investing. That is a lie. That is not the holy grail of investing. There is no holy grail of investing. That is actually the cure that is worse than the, than the disease. What, we, what modern portfolio theory does is it optimizes 
a problem, the wrong problem. It's optimizing a problem that's optimizable, which is this, which they had, has the machinery for this mean variance sharp ratio space, mm -hmm. even though it makes you poor. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a huge problem, but, but the reason they do it is understandable. Like I said, it's the problem that's optimizable. When we start trying to um, think about compound growth rates, terminal wealth as a goal for our risk mitigation strategies, that's something that becomes really, really hard. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's almost impossible. In fact, I, I think I've shown in my book, mathematically, you have to focus on the big losses to even have a chance to do it. Mm -hmm. You really have to go about it. It looks very self-serving, but it's just, yep. it's just kind of a mathematical fact. It's not esoteric math. It's the math of the way compounding in the world works. You have to focus on the big losses. And, and maybe the way that you know, modern portfolio theory was uh, best exported um, to my, myself and you know, the other common folk in the room is 60-40 portfolios. And we've seen they've had a challenging couple of years. And, and I'm imagining from your seat, you see these numbers on these returns and, and the number of people who have been pushed into these. And you're saying, well, of course. I mean, this is exactly you know, why this is not the kind of um, balance or diversification, perhaps, that, that may be suggested when you get you know, a quick one-sheeter. Well, it's easy to pick on 60-40 now because bonds have just been destroyed, right? It's so easy. I'm not going to kick them all the way down. It's so obvious, right? But I would have said this three years ago, four or five years ago. Um, when diversification, diversification gets a win, which maybe, maybe they, you lose less in a crash, let's say, it's like it's a pyrrhic victory because you end up paying for it in the recovery. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? It, you'll get cut by it. Um, it is very much a pyrrhic, and we know these pyrrhic victories. It's a cliche, you know? Governments are famous for it, right? In my book, I talk about the SS Eastland, where you know, we know the, the, in 1912, the, the, the tragedy of the Titanic, without, all of a sudden the government gave regulations on needing a certain amount of lifeboats on board. And it, three years later, after the Titanic, the SS East, Eastland capsizes in the Chicago River because of the weight of these lifeboats, killing more paying passengers than died on the, on the Titanic. That's very much the right way to think about um, modern portfolio theory, diversifying strategies in, in general. They're, they're a pyrrhic victory. And, and on that, it, it makes me think of another analogy that, that, that comes up in the book, which is the Fed and forest firefighters and the way that those two um, organizations, let's see, uh, share a common approach to managing risk. And I'm curious how you see that in this current moment. We're always constantly talking about the Fed, et cetera, et cetera. But just where you see them in their journey and maybe where they have failed markets um, in the past, failing them today, if they are, um, and, and what the evolution of you know, mo monetary policy essentially in this market you know, might be to you. Yeah, monetary policy is the most destructive force, force in, the, in, in, in the global economy. It's, it's taken a natural, uh, healthy, homeostatic process, which is crashes, bankruptcy, recession, and it's turned it into something um, that is, it is dangerous and destructive. This is what they've done in, in, in eliminating, trying to eliminate recessions and crashes. They've turned it into, you know, they've turned, we, we created this tinderbox, right? I mean, I go over it ad nauseum in my first book. Um, they've created a tinderbox. So it's the same kind of what I call risk mitigation irony. Right? They, they try to, I mean, govern, the government is there to try to ultimately try to mitigate these risks for us, and they end up just making it worse, right? But, and that's kind of, we, we get that, but shouldn't it be that, shouldn't it be in, in finance, shouldn't it be that risk mitigation um, costs less than the, than the very thing would cost that, you were, who's, who, who, that you're trying to mitigate against happening, right? Shouldn't it be that way? It's so obvious, but nobody would agree with me in, 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 this, in this industry, right? But um, no, we're, we're living in a tinderbox time bomb. And so, you know, as we kind of get to the end of our conversation, um, I'm curious, you know, what our, our audience perhaps can take away in terms of either actions they should take or just frameworks that they can now apply to their own strategies. Because, you know, I don't, I don't think that I'm going to meet the minimum for investing with Universa. I don't know how many people will. Um, but there are certainly things that you guys are doing that can be applicable or ways, frameworks that people can, can approach their own investing. And, you know, what was something that you might tell someone who, Oh, I guess I just asked the question. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I get this all the time, and none of the things that I do, retail investors can look, can do. But it looks and it looks like I'm teasing, but that uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Be be and be because uh, I think the mindset is so important. Be discerning about risk mitigation. Understanding that your risk mitigation strategy, your the way you allocate your capital in order to mitigate risk, is going to be the most costly thing that you do. 
right? That in and of itself, I think, moves the needle. But I recognize that I also look, I'm here saying that risk mitigation ultimately is not cost effective and don't do it. And at the same time, we are in the biggest credit bubble in human history, in my opinion. And I don't think that that's, that's, that should be a controversial statement. That seems a little bit hypocritical, right? Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't mitigate risk for that. Um, but I don't think it is hypocritical because at the same time, um, I think that anybody who's trying to prepare for that, um, I think that the market is set up right now such that they'll get, they'll get squeezed out of their position. I, I think there's probably um, a, another run or two left before we actually see that. I've been saying that for a year. So anybody who actually tries to mitigate risk, they're, they're not going to be able to keep it. That, that is the problem. I mean, ultimately, you need to think of risk mitigation not as protecting yourself from the markets, but I think more than anything else, protecting yourself from yourself from the really stupid things that we all do. And this applies to professionals, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, look how short people have been this year. Look how short people were last fall, how short they are right now, yeah. right? Or underinvested. People, the markets make us do really stupid things. And we just need to set up our portfolio to protect us from that. All right, Marcus Pixangle, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for the time. My pleasure. <clears throat>